the best things I think that uh, that we have going on, and so we uh, look forward to Operation Christmas Child. Um, I want to make special mention, we have Wilma here today, so uh, if you haven't uh, seen her yet, uh, thank you, Wilma, for being here. Nobody has any excuse not to be here if Jack and Wilma can make it. So uh, from now on, no excuses allowed. Uh, glad to have you here. I also understand, I didn't know this, but uh, somebody told me, whispered in my ear, uh, Leonard Michael's turning 93 tomorrow. Um, seems like a pretty decent accomplishment. I can remember when uh, Leonard... A few years ago, we were just talking about a new building, and he said, well, I hope I live long enough to see uh, the new building. A couple more weeks, Leonard, and uh, we'll be there. So uh, we hope you'll have many wonderful times in the new building. December 16th, remember, is our date. We'll get some dates out in a letter this week, so you can look for that. If you don't see one or a chimp mail, one of the two, please let us know, but um, that's the date you can put on your calendar that we trust. If everything goes well, we will uh, be occupying that building for the first time. Would you please um, stand with me this morning as we read God's Word today, reading from Philippians chapter 3, and beginning this morning in verse 17. This is the Word of God to us. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. Let's pray together, our Father, as we lift our hearts to you this morning. It's with thanksgiving that you have given us a word to live by, truth that leads us, first of all, to faith in the wonderful Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for our sins, the one who has given his life in order that we might have life, and then you've given us further instruction to obey for your glory and for our good. And our desire, Father, is to carry that out. We pray this morning for those who have once again been bereaved in horrible ways in our own country. These things now seem commonplace almost. And our hearts go out to those, Father, who have suffered loss that we'll forget about in three or four days, but they will live with now for decades. Would you please bring comfort and help? We pray as well, Father, that the things that you intend through allowing these things to happen, for your word is clear that that's the case, that you will, that your voice will be heard by those who are not listening, that there will be a recognition that we are not in control of our own destinies. That until and unless we seek help from somewhere else, someone bigger than us, someone who has the power over all things, we are lost. This message, would it please, by your grace, get across to people who are watching. But Father, we have the opportunity as believers to try and represent that message in the way that we show compassion to each other, first of all, and love for each other, and then beyond our own circle to the world around us. And we pray that will be the case. Operation Christmas Child is just one way we can do that, but we can go around the world every day by praying for those who are missionaries, for the low seats, and the work that they do in the, in the Middle East. For Teresa, this young lady who is giving her life to minister to people physically and spiritually in Bangladesh through her nursing skills, to Bob and Ellen who are providing homes for children who otherwise would not have homes, to Bob and Jan who are making the message of the Lord Jesus known through radios and other technology where it otherwise would not be known, and many others, Father, that you give us for Curtin 
Melissa in our own midst, ministering to international students right here. For the Declays in Montreal, sharing your word and also ministering to those who have been caught up in this sex trafficking industry. Lord, they're just, we pray for all of them. We pray for encouragement. We pray for, for enlightenment for the people that they minister to, for fruitfulness in their ministry. And we pray that you will help us to have hearts of compassion, that at least we will pray and then give as you give us the opportunity. Thank you, Father, for your many blessings. They far exceed anything that we deserve. And we thank you for them. We pray now that you will help us, guide us, speak to us through your word. May your spirit, as always, be the teacher. And may you cause our lives to be changed as a result of the things that you have to say to us even this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and if you've not already, please turn to Philippians chapter 3, as we'll be there this morning. You might also, uh, if you'd like to hold your thumb in a place, 1 Samuel 2. 1 Samuel 2, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 5, among other places. The question that this passage that we've read kind of poses to us is, who are your heroes? Have you got any heroes? The fact is, we all do. We all need them. And actually, we all have them. Picture is worth a thousand words. And so we particularly need, as Christians, godly examples. We know that our ultimate example is Christ, and we can read about him in Scripture, and the Bible tells us that we should be looking to Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith. And so that's the ultimate place we would look. But we also... Look to other people as well. Paul says it right here in our passage. Brothers, join in imitating me. Could you say that? I think it's kind of interesting that Paul wasn't shy to say, follow me. Be like me. He didn't say that because he was perfect. He knew he wasn't perfect. He admitted it just up above this as we saw last week. But he was a flesh and blood example of someone who had a single-minded purpose to become like Jesus. And so he wasn't shy about saying to people, imitate me if you don't know what else to do. Imitate me. He says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Let me give you help. Follow me. Paul knows that we need heroes. He knows that we all copy others. Consciously or unconsciously, and he's urging that we make sure we select people who are worthy to pattern our lives after. You know, if that was needed in Paul's day, and it certainly was, how much more is it needed now, right? The heroes we used to have were people who exemplified some of the finer qualities that we might think about, qualities of honor, of duty, of humility, of service to others, of dignity, but you know, with, as, as our society becomes increasingly secular, have you noticed that those things take a lower, keep climbing lower on the totem pole? And I think it's particularly true as, this, as social media has hit us, and we hardly know we've been hit, but boy, the changes it has made in life and in every phase of who we are. Some for the good and many not for so good, because with social media, anybody can become a hero. Anybody. Can put a, who's, who's willing to put themselves out there can become a hero, sometimes with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. I mean, the, the example that came to my mind, it's only one of many. Uh, I hope I don't step on anybody's toes, but how about the Kardashians? Somebody want to tell me where the redeeming quality is there? I haven't seen it or found it yet. But they represent this kind of new thing that we have, heroes who, who have absolutely no redeeming qualities, but because they are attractive and they know how to attract attention, they become to people heroes. You can't turn off your computer without being bombarded by the most recent foolishness of someone who is a celebrity simply because they are notorious. When you consider this, that we tend to become like those we revere, the the situation is, 
is somewhat serious, right? Kids and adults both. When we're attracted, some celebrity must ask, is this somebody that's worthy to be attracted to? Is this somebody who's worthy of our attention? Is this somebody who is worthy to occupy even two minutes of my time to check out what they're doing now? Perhaps you heard of the young woman who fell overboard on a cruise ship, you know, and next thing she knew, there's a 70-year-old guy there in the water kind of pulling her out, getting her into a rescue boat. So they had a big banquet that night in his honor, and they got him up there and said they wanted a speech from him. He made one of the shortest speeches in history. He said, I just want to know one thing. Who pushed me? <laughs> Being fated as a hero, but he really wasn't much of a hero, right? And I'm afraid that is a, that is a statement that could be made about so many of our self-promoters in our day. So Paul's asking, who's your hero? Who do you emulate, consciously or unconsciously? Who do you pattern your life after? And then he offers himself. But before he really describes himself, he first lets us know there are others that some people are following as well. Some others that the Philippians have turned their attention to. Some others that they are emulating who are not worthy of being followed. If, if, you, could, if you could confine, and, and we'll look at the various characteristics of these people, but if you could say there's one main characteristic of them, it is that they are, in verse 19, they have their minds set on earthly things. Unworthy heroes have their minds set on earthly things. Paul is focused higher. And he wants us to be focused higher. But in the meantime, he wants us to know the danger. It comes down to, are we going to have people who are heroes as our heroes, people who are nearsighted, seeing only the here and now, or people who are far-sighted, who are looking beyond just what's here and now, realizing that a hundred years from now, I will be somewhere, that a thousand years from now, I'll be somewhere, that a million years from now, I will, be, I will be somewhere, and that what I have done now and the decisions I have made now will have an impact on that if the Bible is true. So he's saying, look higher. If you want nearsighted heroes or far-sighted heroes, I can tell you, you don't want nearsighted probably. I'm, I am one, nearsighted. If I don't have my glasses on, you may want, you're not going to want to follow me. You may want to not want to follow me even if I have them on, but certainly if I don't, we could be in trouble. These, these followers that Paul's going to, or these leaders that Paul's going to talk about are too, too nearsighted. And so we want to look today at earthly-minded, nearsighted celebrities. Next week we'll look at what are some of the characteristics of farsighted champions that we could follow. Earthly-minded celebrities. Paul gives five characteristics. He doesn't tell us who they are exactly. They could be the Judaizers who follow him from town to town. You remember these. They are professing Christians who are also from a Jewish background, and they keep coming into town after Paul has left town and saying, hey, what Paul told you about Jesus is fine. Believe in Jesus if you'd like. But what you really need to do is obey the Jewish laws particularly the law of circumcision, but the rest of it. You, that's what really saves you. The Judaizers, professing Christians who were adding to the gospel. Could have been the, the, the pagan philosophers of the day. They believed in dualism. They believed the spirit is good. They believed the body is evil. And basically their conclusion was you can do whatever you want to with your body. Any licentiousness, any way you want to treat it is fine because it's going to get thrown away at the end of the day anyway. So you can... Follow it wherever you want to go. It's the spirit that's important. Could have been them. We don't know. Paul doesn't really tell us exactly who these are. I think he does that because it could be almost anybody, and that's the point he wants to make. It could be professing Christians who really aren't because they add to the gospel. It could be people who are real believers, but they are living a carnal lifestyle. It could be completely pagan people, outright unbelievers, we might choose heroes from any of those. But he's going to say, whoever your heroes are, make sure they're not like this. Make sure they don't have these characteristics in their life that you are following. So let's look at these five. First of all, he says, they, what characterizes false heroes is the disposition that they represent. The disposition that they represent. It's an earthly disposition. 
It's a disposition that is interested only in the here and now. Now, if death is truly the end, and that's all there is, then these might be somebody that are worthy to follow. It could be that the philosophy of you only go around once, so get all the gusto you can, would be the right philosophy. But if there is a future life, and if that life is affected by the decisions and the actions that we take now, that would be a pretty short-sighted view, wouldn't it? And so that's what Paul is getting at here. These earthly-minded uh, heroes often, unfortunately, are attractive. They're often outwardly happy, sometimes reputable people. Seem to be living the lifestyle of the, of the rich and famous. You know, they seem to have it all. But the bottom line is they have far too little. They have far too little. Because however much you have of this life, beloved, there isn't be too, be too long and it's going to be gone. It's all going to disappear like a wisp of smoke. The thing that seems most real to you will be gone. Think about that for a moment. You'll outlive most of it. And the rest of it will be gone when you're gone. So he says they look like they have a lot. They really have too little. Now, that doesn't mean that earthly things can't be enjoyed. Earthly things can and should be enjoyed. What does the Bible say in James 1? Every good and perfect gift comes from God, right? And is intended to be enjoyed. He says in 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. In other words, use it with thanksgiving and gratefully in the way that God wanted it to be used. But as soon as those things begin to take top priority, as soon as they get to the top of the list of the things that we're interested in, that's when they become a problem. That's why Paul advises in 1 Timothy 6, again, verse 17, he says, as for the rich of this age, those who have all these things, they've got all these earthly things that you can think of. As to the rich of this present age, charge them not to be haughty, get proud, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who provides richly everything to enjoy. He's saying, listen, don't worship the gift. Worship the giver. Don't put your certainty on the things that you've got. Trust in the God who gave them to you. Those who have their mindset on earth, earthly things are focusing too low. They're settling for too little. They're spiritually short-sighted. Paul wants us to be 2020 vision in terms of reality. He doesn't want us to be like Sandy McIntyre. Sandy McIntyre was a guy who came from Scotland to Ontario in Canada in the early days of the 20th century because there was a gold rush going on in Ontario in those days. So he came and he began to mine for gold and he found some. Got a strike. He was deliriously happy. Somebody came along and offered to buy it from him, and he, and he finally sold it. He sold it for $12,000 in 1912. $5,000 in 1912 was a lot of money. Supported him for several years. Basically spent his life going from one saloon to another up in Canada, spending his money. Meantime, the people who bought his McIntyre mine took $230 million worth of gold out of it. That's a sad story. That's nothing compared to those of us who put our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations into earthly things to the complete neglect of the spiritual things who are totally absorbed with the things that are seen as opposed to the realities of the things that are unseen. Read 2 Corinthians 4 sometime and see how Paul nails this topic, telling us that the things that are seen are just temporal. The things that are unseen are the things that are real. And so we need to get focused there, not be nearsighted. This is the disposition of those who are false heroes. Secondly, false, false heroes are characterized then by the deity that they revere. The deity that they revere, the God that they worship. <clears throat> what God is that? Verse 19, their God is their belly. Well, that's an interesting God. What does that mean? They like 
They like six-pack abs. That's what they're, that's what they're after. Or maybe the opposite of that, they, they are gluttons, you know. Their whole life revolves around what, what's the next meal going to be. We all have that tendency, I suppose. Is that what he's talking about? Well, I think the wording that he uses here is probably a metaphor for something that's a little bit deeper than that, although that, could be, that certainly could be part of it in either case. But, you know, in, in another passage in 1 Corinthians Six, Paul, Paul tells us something that the philosophers of his day used to say. The philosophers had a, had a saying that was, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. What did, what did that mean? It meant if I have a desire, I should try and fill it. If I have a desire, I should try and fill it. The belly is a metaphor for any physical appetite. And what the saying means is, if I have an appetite, if I have a desire for something, and I have the means to fulfill it, go for it. I mean, have at it. Food was made for the belly. The belly was made for food. Let's get the two together. Does that sound familiar? It's, it's like, it's, you know what it is? The, it's the first century version of the Playboy philosophy. Nothing new under the sun, is there? Paul is speaking here of the insatiable desire to pursue pleasure, whether it's food, drink, ambition, sex, gambling, whatever it is. If it's the Lord over you, you have the wrong Lord. If that's your God, you have the wrong God. But that's the characteristic of so many people, whatever the nature of it is. Let me just give you one example out of the Bible. This is in 1 Samuel 2. So if you've turned there already, you're ahead of the rest of us, and we'll find it. 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is a story about a man named Eli who was a priest in Israel. And Eli had some sons who were also priests, though they were not worthy ones. But they had followers. They had followers. They were not good leaders, but they had people who were following them as heroes. But look what they did. 1 Samuel 2, begin in verse 22. Now Eli was old, very old. And he kept hearing that his sons were doing, he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel. How they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent meeting. In other words, these were priests who were seducing the women and girls who came to worship at the temple. Doesn't tell us how they did it. Somehow they imposed their will, they imposed the religion, and somehow they were able to seduce these women. They were also taking, although it doesn't tell us it here, it tells us later in the passage, they were also taking, as they offered sacrifices, they were taking the best parts of the, of the meat of the animals, the stuff that was supposed to be reserved for God. God made provision that the priests could take certain parts of the animals and have them. But the best parts of the animals, to make a point, God said, you're gonna, that's what you burn. That's what becomes a sweet odor, a sacrifice, aroma in God's, in God's mouth, uh, God's uh, nose, because he's seeing that we are serious about our relationship with him. And so they were to burn the best and then take some of the rest that could be for them. But not them. They're taking the prime rib, boy. Get that out of there. Take that home and have that. They were unfaithful leaders. They were, they were, these were men whose God was their belly. They're an example of what Paul, exactly what Paul is talking about. Don't follow people like that. People whose ambition extends no, no further than what they can get out of this life. Whatever it is that is driving them, don't follow them there. The belly of appetites, the original party animals. This is no place that a Christian ought to find himself, a true believer. These are not the heroes we need to be worshiping. Paul says it this way in Romans 16, 18. He says, avoid such persons who do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. He said, well, where do those appetites come from? Where do those desires come from? Don't they come from God? Didn't God make me this way? For so many people say that. Well, it's God that made me this way. 
Did God give us our appetites? Absolutely. God made us all the way that we are, but he never intended that those desires and those appetites be the end all. He dis in fact, he gives us instructions about how those things are to be used. He tells us how to use them safely as opposed to just any old way we want. I mean, you don't have to look very far in nature to find out that things that are wonderful can also be destructive. Fire is a wonderful thing, right? We, I mean, if you live in Colorado, you're going to like fire. But you get fire outside of its boundaries, and it's a horribly destructive thing, isn't it? And that's exactly the way it is with the desires that God has placed within us. And that's exactly why he gave us an instruction book to tell us, here's what's right, and here's what's wrong. Do what's right, and you will prosper, and I will prosper you. Do what's wrong, and you may pay a heavy price. I want you to enjoy what I've given, but it has to be by my instructions. This is where the lie goes so far, because the lie says that's repression. If you repress the desires, you're going to be a, you're going to be an uptight person, and you may well be if you don't do it for the right reasons. But you and you, you obey God out of a heart of love for what He's done for you, and you're going to find you're not a repressed person. You're a free person. You're the only free person. God's rules are freedom. They are not restrictive. Peter says it this way, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, he says, for the time is past, uh, for the time, sorry, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. He's Peter saying, listen, get over it. You belong to God. Did God give you those desires? Yes, but not to be used in that way. You're destroying yourself. So whether your hero is a professing Christian like Eli's boys were, or an avowed pagan like someone else that you may choose to follow, don't follow someone whose God is their appetites. If you're lusting after the, lust, you know, the lifestyle of the rich and famous, you may have the wrong heroes. A party hardy is kind of your philosophy. You may need some new examples. Listen, Christian living can be fun and joyous without making a God of pleasure and without waking up the next morning with a hangover. There are benefits to following the guidelines that God gives us about how to live. So we have heroes, false heroes, who are characterized by the disposition that they represent, the disposition of earth, earthliness, by the deity that they revere, their own desires, their own pleasures. Thirdly, they are characterized by the disgrace that they relish, the disgrace that they relish. Look at verse 19 again. They glory in their shame. In other words, they advertise the things that are really wrong in their behavior. They take pride in their immorality. They, far from being shameful, they are the opposite. You know, it reminds me, Adam, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and suddenly they sin, and immediately they recognize what? That they're naked, and they, so they try to clothe themselves. And I think there's far more going on there than just being ashamed before each other. They're ashamed before God, because that's the one they're running from. But even with, the, with each other, suddenly they recognize the nakedness. They have shame. Even though they, as a married couple, were rightfully naked with each other. Boy, that kind of shame has gone the way of the steam engine, has it not? Today's celebrities unashamedly compete to see who can post the most revealing pose online. God's sexual guidelines are considered laughable, unfortunately, even in the church, where premarital sex extramarital sex is considered, well, normal under certain... You love each other, you should do it. Where 
homosexuality is considered an appropriate way to express love. We've come a long way, baby, right? Or have we? Because you see, Paul faced the same problems back in the first century. There's nothing new. Turn me to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. The Corinthians had a problem that Paul addresses, one of many that he addresses. But 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, Paul says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. <laughs> What he's saying is there, they were tolerating some guy sleeping with his stepmother. And they were proud of it. Now, we don't know all the details. Why was this going on? Why was this guy under what guise was this justified? We love each other. You know, the father is a, is a reprobate and he's gone anyway. And so the son and the stepmother get together. We don't know the details. It doesn't tell us. But undoubtedly in some way in some manner this was being spun as a good thing. And the Corinthians were proud of themselves that they were so tolerant that even though the pagans around them would never have allowed this, they were allowing it. They were generous. They were loving. Amazing, isn't it? Paul says in verse 6 of that chapter, he says, your boasting is not good. You think this is a good thing. Let me tell you, Guys, your boasting is not good, and you can read on what else he did. But this is it's nothing new. In 150, 150 years after this time, Hippolytus of Rome speaks of a group of supposed Christians who were called the Simonians. And he said, about this, he said this about them. They actually congratulate themselves on their promiscuity because they say that is what is meant by perfect love. If you love someone, want to have sex with them, you just do it. That's a love. It's an act of love. Sounds exactly like John A.T. Robertson, who said in the 20th century in the 1960s, wrote the book Honest to God, and basically said, anything done in love is good. Anything. And by that, he basically meant sexual promiscuity. Calvin faced it in Geneva in the 16th century, where a group called the Libertines group of supposed Christians, again, boasted of their sexual promiscuity. They argued that, listen to this, they argued that communion of the saints meant sharing bodies with whoever you wanted to. So one man would have another man's wife and so on. They openly practiced adultery. And then they came to Calvin's church and expected to take communion. You don't know Calvin if you think that went well. One of them, a man named Philibert Berthelier, who was a kind of a rich man, he actually went to the city council and he said, listen, I'm taking communion over here in Calvin's church. He said, do I have, I, I want your permission to go and do this by force. And they gave him permission. So he walked in the next Sunday with men with him with swords drawn because he was going to have communion or he was going to kill somebody. Can you believe this went on? Calvin came down from the pulpit and stood in front of the communion table, and he said this. He said, these hands you may crush, these arms you may lop off. My life you may take, but you shall never force me to give holy things to the profaned and dishonor the table of God. In the face of that kind of opposition, they turned around and left. One can only hope that they turned around and repented at some point. But do you see how easy it is to spin things? And it's nothing new. It's been going on for years. We're not the first people, beloved. We're not the first people to spin sexual misconduct as wholesome. And if your heroes go down that road, you need to reconsider who your heroes are. They're not on God's hero list. They glory in their shame. They're not on God's hero list, neither are others who might be, think that they are, you know, running roughshod over others, who are using 
coarse language or off-color stories in order to get in with the guys who are spreading gossip in the guise of prayer requests. Watch your heroes. Be careful that they're not someone who is glorying in what should be shameful. And I must say, we, we all have to watch this, right? I mean, I mean it's, it's tough, but be, we, we need to be careful. And I, I know this, this is going to seem like it's saying more ladies, and it, and it probably is, but you, you need to be careful how you dress. That you're not the cause of shame in somebody else. I mean, I mean, it's their problem. It's true, but you could be held accountable as well. We need to be careful who our heroes are and who we're following, who we're emulating, whatever the conditions. They glory in their shame. Fourthly, they are characterized, false heroes are characterized by the doom, by the doom that they realize. Look at verse 19 again. Their end is destruction. Now, please notice, it's their end that's destruction. It's not the beginning that's destruction. It's not the middle that's destruction. It's not even three-quarters of the way that's destruction. It's their end that's destruction. That's why it is so, you know, it, it's, 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 it's so uh, tempting to just follow on because, hey, they're getting away with it. Everything's good. That's because, beloved, the end is the destruction. The end is destruction. Somebody said, I saw somebody doing such and such, and, you know, God didn't do anything. And somebody else said, well, God doesn't do the harvest until October. It's the end that's destruction. Do you see? Things can look really good. The heroes you choose to emulate may seem like they're getting away with it. But one day the party's over. One day the party's over. Those who live only for this life, whose God is their appetites, who glory in their shame, suddenly an eternity is going to stretch out before them, an eternity for which they have made no preparation. And their end is destruction. You know, one of the, I, I always think of Ben Franklin in this regard. I mean, I think of a lot of people. But Ben Franklin, a few, just a few weeks before he died, and Ben Franklin was not without, at least at some level, you know, an understanding. I mean, Christian faith was kind of, <laughs> was, it was kind of ubiquitous in those days, right? And, and, and he has, one of his friends was George Whitfield, who was as, who, who was as good a, a, a preacher and represented the gospel as there ever was. And somebody said, you're going to hear Whitfield? And he said, yeah. He said, why? You don't believe it? He said, yeah, but he does. He loved and appreciated someone who really had faith and believed it, but somehow it never became Franklin's as far as we know. Ezra Stiles, who was the president of Yale at that time, asked him about his faith just these few weeks before he died. Here's what Franklin said. He said, as to Jesus of Nazareth, I have some doubts as to his divinity, though it is a question I do not dogmatize upon, having never studied it. And think it needless to busy myself with it now when I expect soon to have an opportunity of knowing the truth with less trouble. <laughs> it just amazes me because here's a man who studied everything. There was nobody more curious, more wise in the ways of philosophy and diplomacy and science and whatever you want to name than Benjamin Franklin, right? But when it came to theology, he said, eh, I never really studied it. And I'm not worried about it because I'm going to die pretty soon, and then I'll find out. Yeah, you will. But it wouldn't have taken much, to, much study to find out that it matters whether you decide for Jesus now or not, right? That now is the day of salvation. It wouldn't have taken much study to find out that the rich man who didn't know Jesus in Luke 16 lifted up his eyes in hell. And then he knew, but it was too late. Their end is destruction. Don't wait till the end. It's too late. The false doom that heroes realize is the doom that they bring on themselves by ignoring God's revelation. God didn't write this book, beloved, just so it could sit on our shelves.
To ignore God now is to die later, and there's nothing heroic about that, right? I don't know Franklin's end. I mean, I, you can only hope that he came to faith in Christ in those next few weeks. But I know that those who never come to faith in Christ face an end that is destruction. No wise person would want to follow them there. Their end is destruction. Finally, in this passage, I see the deliverance that they reject. The deliverance that they reject. False heroes reject the deliverance that's right in front of them. Paul describes it as their major folly in verse 18. He says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. They walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their main issue, beloved, is not that they are earthly minded. It's not that they pursue only their desires or that they glory in their disgrace. The problem that dwarfs everything is that they're enemies of the cross. And you ask, what does it mean to be an enemy of the cross? I mean, we all know, okay, Jesus died on the cross. That's a pretty well-known fact in history. So what is it to me? I'm not a, you know, I may not be a believer, but I'm not an enemy either. Oh, but you are. But you are. If you deny what the cross was about, then you're an enemy of the cross. You may not hate the cross. You may not love the cross. You just are indifferent to the cross. But if you're indifferent to the cross, you're an enemy of the cross. Because on the cross, God was dying for your sin. You can't be apathetic to that and not realize you are an enemy of the cross. Do you see how important that is? And what Paul is saying is false, false heroes are enemies of the cross. They reject the significance of the cross. They deny the significance of what was happening there. The God on that cross paid the unthinkable price of his own holiness so that we would not have to be faced with that. Some deny the cross by claiming that it's just another tragedy of history. You know, another, unfortunately, another great gifted young man who died too young, kind of like Caesar or, or, um, or Lincoln or Gandhi. Just kind of tragic, but that's all. Doesn't make me an enemy of the cross, does it? Yes, it does if you deny the significance. I mean, that would be bad enough, but worse are those who claim the Christian faith, but they deny that Jesus was there willingly, purposely, intentionally by the predetermined plan of God before the history of time ever began to provide redemption for lost sinners. This is the Bible message. And if you deny that, you are an enemy of the cross. The deliverance is there. The deliverance is bought and paid for. The deliverance has been provided by God himself. But to deny the significance of what he's done is to be an enemy of the cross, and to be an enemy of the cross is, of course, to be an enemy of God. And, beloved, this happens with pastors. Let me read to you from a faith column in our own local paper a few months ago. This is a Greeley area pastor. He's writing near Easter, just before Good Friday, and explaining how he understands Good Friday from his childhood. He says this. He says, On this day of dying, the speakers at the Good Friday service offered explanations about why someone I loved had suffered some said it was because we are evil. But I couldn't imagine what I had done that had led to the death of one about whom I sang every week, Jesus loves me. Some said God was angry and needed to sacrifice to save people. But I didn't want to think that God would kill anyone. Notice he didn't say, 
I have good evidence to show that this isn't true. He just said, I, I didn't want to think that. I didn't want to believe that. I don't want to be accountable to God. I was just an innocent little kid. It sounds so seductively reasonable, doesn't it? But do you, do you realize it denies everything that the Bible teaches about God's holiness, about man's sinfulness and our inability to stand before God without falling completely short. It denies everything the Bible teaches about God's love, providing a sacrifice to satisfy his own perfect, per perfection and his own holiness. To deny the cross is not a defense of God's love, beloved. It's a denial of God's love. This man is a pastor. He's a hero to many. He's also an enemy of the cross because he's denied the message of the whole Bible summarized in Hebrews 10, 12, where God says this, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The cross is about one thing. It's about Jesus dying for the sins to pay the penalty that you and I cannot pay except by an eternity of separation from God. That's what the cross is. And to interpret it any other way is to be an enemy of the cross and to be an enemy, therefore, of God. Pastors like that are like the Pharisees to whom Jesus said this in Matthew 23. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte follower. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? But what's he describing? He's describing those who are an enemy of the cross in terms that nobody could miss. False heroes leading others to destruction along with themselves. Paul wept as he said this. He wept for those who were the false heroes and he wept for those who were following them. We must never take for our heroes someone who would be an enemy of the cross because be remember, we become like who our heroes are. We become like those whom we emulate. So young people, especially, who are your heroes? Who are you emulating? Who are you following? Who are you on Twitter following? Whose blog do you watch? Who's the hero in your life? Who are you patting your life, patterning your life after adults? Same questions. Who do you want to be like? Are they worthy? Or are they only earthly-minded? Are they worshiping their appetites? Are they glorying in things that should be, should be ashamed of? Are they enemies of the cross because they are indifferent to the cross or denying the message of what happened at the cross? Who are your heroes? You need to consider who you're emulating this morning. As a boy living in Kansas... I got intrigued by a guy who used to do a fitness program on TV, Jack LaLanne. You all remember Jack LaLanne? Probably everybody here has done exercises with Jack LaLanne, right, at one time or another, at least for a couple minutes. When we moved to California, and Jack LaLanne was more well-known there because he used to come down to Southern California, and every year on his birthday, he used to swim one mile, pulling as many rowboats as his age. That's one thing when you're, you know, 20. Think about when you're 60, 70. And he was still doing it in those days. He was a nice guy. Fitness guru. He wrote a many. He once said this, my workout is my obligation to life. It's my tranquilizer. It's part of the way I tell the truth. And telling the truth is what's kept me going all these years. Is there anything wrong with exercise? No. Is it truthful that if you exercise, you're probably going to live better and longer? Yes truth there? Is that your God? Oh, I hope not. Because here's what else Jack LaLanne said. He said to me, this one, he said this when he was 93, by the way. 
He said, to me, this one thing, physical culture and nutrition is the salvation of America. Billy Graham is for the hereafter. I'm for the here and now. The salvation of America? Really? It wasn't even the salvation of Jack LaLanne. Because four years later, Jack LaLanne was dead. And all the exercise that he had done for all those years didn't save him. Now, was he really not interested in the hereafter at all? Did he really have no interest in eternity? Did he really make no preparation? I don't know. But I can't see somebody's heart. All I know is those statements are fantastically silly in light of eternity. Watch who are your heroes. Are they worthy? Make sure they are leading you to life and not destruction because they are leading you to one or the other. Right? They are. Let's follow those who will lead us to life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Help us to choose our heroes wisely. Thank you that there are multiple and many people who are worthy to look to as heroes because they have a mind and a mindset that goes beyond just this earth. They don't glory in their things that should be shameful. Their God is not their belly or their natural desires. Their God is you. And so they are worthy of emulation. They're not enemies of the cross. They glory in the cross as you do and as we must. Because it is our only, only means of eternal salvation. And so Lord, I pray that you will help us today to re-examine. Make sure that those we're following are worthy to follow. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.